Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing fantastic today, Tim. Everyone listening, I hope they're doing fantastic. You're nodding along like you're doing fantastic. Is that the case? Yeah, I am doing great here. And uh, this conversation is interesting. It's exciting to me. It's a little bit different from what we normally cover. This is not a current missing persons case. We are joined by our cohort, Jennifer Amell, over here for this conversation about a Jane Doe known as Little Miss Nobody, who was found on July 31st, 1960 in Congress, Arizona. And we want to send a big thank you to Marianne for the assistance with the research on this episode. Yeah, she did an amazing job putting all the pieces together and all the details together so that it unfolds in this really fascinating narrative. And you mentioned that this was from 1960. And what's impressive is that this was a a situation where a little girl, four years old, has been kidnapped. And as far as we can see, there was never a period of time where it wasn't like truly being worked on when the resources became available. So they went from 1960, where there wasn't a lot of resources looking into something like this, to today. And we'll, we'll get into all of that. It's, it's a little bittersweet. And we, we've used fascinating, we've used, you know, interesting conversation, but it's also a little creepy, too, when we start unpeeling the layers of the kidnapping itself and the suspects. It sure is. And it's heart wrenching as well. This is a four year old girl who, who was a murder victim. But there is some resolution in this case. Um, it's not fully resolved. However, the suspects are still at large. And there really isn't much out there for description of these suspects. So if you find anything, please send it our way. And I'm really curious to see if we get any feedback from anyone that's in that area or was in that area or had family in that area who heard of this or maybe heard of other kids that were being stalked or attempted kidnappings because it didn't feel like this was a one-off when we were talking about it. It felt like it was really plotted out, almost meticulously And at the same time, almost violently, almost aggressively, when you hear about the kids' accounts of what happened. And Lance, we want to tell our listeners about our subscription service. You can check it out at missing.supportingcast.fm. You will get ad-free episodes and bonus content for a very reasonable price. You are right, Tim. It is a very reasonable price, especially when you consider that you could be part of our text club Stay tuned for more details on that. That's something that we are very excited about. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening. Please follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Welcome back to Missing. Jennifer Amell, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me back. Well, thank you for joining us for this particular case that we're speaking about today. Marianne White put this research together for us. And since she delivered this to us, uh, I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you, Jen, because I really am interested in getting your perspective on this particular individual. And a big shout out to Marianne for the amazing work she did on this. So uh, as much as I hate to say I'm looking forward to talking about a tragic event, I am very curious to hear your thoughts on everything here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reviewing this whole case with you guys. It's a very interesting one. Yeah, and it's a little bit different than some of the cases we, or most of the cases we talk about, because this one technically has some answers. Um, It is not solved, I would say, by definition, but uh, part of the mystery was solved in this case recently, too. Cool. Let's get into it. Today's story starts on July 31st, 1960, when a child's body was found by a teacher searching for rocks off of Alamo Road in a remote desert area outside of Congress, Arizona. That's about 56 miles from Prescott, which is one of the bigger towns in that area. And the body was badly decomposed, partially buried, and wearing a checkered blouse, white shorts, and adult-sized flip-flops that had been cut down to fit her small feet. So 1960, what is that? 62 years ago. We're talking about a story that is 62 years old. Mm -hmm. Hard for people to put their heads in that place. You know what I'm saying? Like, 1960 was a long time ago. Yeah, this was an age, of course, before cell phones, the internet, the world was completely different, really. Um, 
And uh, this young girl's fingernails and toenails were painted red. A knife with a stained blade was found near the body, although there was no evidence of any stab wounds. And detectives at the scene believe she was around seven years old. The death was ruled a homicide pretty quickly, but because the body was so badly decomposed, the cause of death could not be determined. And again, the reason I bring up the year 1960 in this regard is because as a detective, when you find a body like this, in in today's times, we think about how they would organize the crime scene or organize the scene of the of the body, how they would start to account for any evidence and think about things like fingerprints and DNA and forensics. And in 1960, they weren't thinking about things like DNA. They weren't thinking about like how to preserve it in those regards. You know, they probably did their best at the time because it's a, a young child, but they just didn't have the resources and the information and the technology right there. It just wasn't there. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there because we're very critical with law enforcement on occasion. And it's tough to be critical with law enforcement here just knowing the things they didn't know. That's a valid point, Lance. I'm not sure. Like, I'm, I need to brush up on my uh, police history. But there there was a point where, like, it became protocol like written in the handbook like how to secure a crime scene i'm not sure if it happened um before or after 1960 but if it didn't then people were just kind of like flying by to this by the seat of their pants like doing what they thought was right but there was nothing written down in stone like this is how you preserve evidence yeah and maybe something that is kind of similar to today in that this little girl got a nickname she had no identity at the time, and she became known as Little Miss Nobody because no one knew who she was or how she died. And the coroner determined that she had been dead one to two weeks before she was found. Yeah. I want to go back to the clothing she was found in. What about these flip-flops cut so they would fit her size? I don't know if that was a common thing people did back in Arizona in 1960, but it sure speaks to somebody who like didn't have the proper wares for children. Like, I don't know if she was taken and she didn't have shoes on. And so they like just fashioned some shoes for her or if it was like a thing her parents did. But I found that to like be interesting. It's just a detail that jumped out at me. Yeah, because it's not like she wasn't wearing any other articles of clothing. It does right. seem like she didn't have shoes. Yeah. So whoever she was in uh, custody of obviously wanted to m make sure that she had something on her feet, you know, and if if she's already fully dressed, like where did the, where did the shoes go in, in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wonder how they cut them. Yeah, good question. Yeah, it, it kind of is an interesting clue. It's a really interesting clue um, because on one hand, you think it's sort of like a sign of convenience, right, by cutting them instead of getting to the store to get like smaller shoes or something like mm -hmm. that. But then she's found uh, dead on, on the ground, partially buried. And so on on the other hand, you're like, well, you know, if she didn't have shoes, they, they gave her shoes. But then presumably, they, you know, they left her dead as well, though. Yeah. And what do you guys make of this knife that was found near her body? I know, like, she's described as being, you know, unfortunately badly decomposed when found. I wonder if she was so decomposed that they couldn't actually tell if there was evidence of stab wounds or if there was enough of the body there to, to say, like, hey, there was no stab wounds here. Because we don't really have a cause of death, do we? No, at least not then, no. You'd think, though, if she was stabbed to the point of dying, that there would be blood there, too, unless she was stabbed elsewhere, preserved. But then why would you drop the body and then drop the murder weapon as well? It could be a knife that just is unrelated. It'd be it'd be a huge coincidence. But if she's, you know, dying from stab wounds, where's where's the blood unless it wasn't uh, present at the time, unless it was washed away? Well, maybe she wasn't killed there, and uh, we do know that the forensics left a bit to be desired um, at <laughs> yes. that time, uh, to say the least. And, um, you know, I think usually with, with stab victims, they can tell uh, based on the bones um, if there are uh, marks in, in the bones of a victim, um, even if their body has been decomposed. So I would guess there were, there were actually no stab wounds here. Yeah, and if not bones, like organs. 
Right. And if she, again, if she was killed elsewhere and stabbed elsewhere, why is the knife, why is she dumped with the knife? Yeah, it's a curious detail. Um, We know from a couple other cases, like we had skeletal remains show up. um, And then upon examination of the skeleton, there were uh, nick marks on the rib cage and like chest area of the victim. And that's how they determined that the victim had been stabbed. I don't know if they went so far as as doing uh, that kind of autopsy with Little Miss Nobody. But um, yeah, you'd like to think they did their due diligence and ruled out a a stabbing-related death. And here's just an opinion question for the two of you. Do you think that this was something that a coroner, just in general, would look at and it it, it might just be too much, like too painful to do a proper autopsy on someone who's so young? Or do you think that by that time coroners are sort of... uh, uh, desensitized to things like that. Yeah, I think in the nature of self-preservation, they have to be desensitized um, before that point. Yeah, you know. Yeah, for sure. You know, and it it might motivate them too to do a better job if they have possible. A, a child. You know, and they want to make sure that the child's cause of death is determined just to give the family or even you know the memory of the child its uh its justice. Mm-hmm. For sure. And there's not as much like room to speculate if it were an adult victim, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you can you can think like, oh, maybe they got lost and expired because they were hiking by themselves. Maybe they committed suicide. There's none of those things that could happen with a child unless she like just wandered away and expired due to, you know, exposure or whatever. But it uh, doesn't seem likely. Right. And if that was the case, you would have a concerned parent, most likely, uh, in the in the nearby vicinity. Exactly. Yeah. So I would think like if I was the coroner or the ME, like I'd, I'd be like, yeah, we need to do a full op- autopsy and figure out how this child died because mm-hmm. it's clearly foul play. Yeah. And investigators in New Mexico initially believed that this Jane Doe was four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos, who was a little girl missing from... Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Sharon had been abducted from an alley behind her home by a couple who had been stalking her, and they dragged her into, quote, a dirty old green car, unquote, just 10 days before this child's remains were found in the Arizona desert. That is just the stuff of, like, childhood nightmares. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, what makes it even worse is the fact that they were stalking her. They were stalking a four-year-old girl. I don't know for how long, but they had planned this. And yeah, come on. Like that is just like what your parents tell you. And you're, you know, when you're a child and then you don't think that it's going to happen because it just sounds so fictional. It's terrifying. But my goodness, like how long was this four year old just left alone to be stalked? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Why is she in an alley by herself? I mean, I know it's like a different time and everything, but still, that's. I think she was playing with uh with some other kids oh i see okay and the child's body that was found however was not wearing what the abducted child sharon lee gallegos had been wearing and the victim seemed to be older than sharon based on the investigators opinions and because the assumed age discrepancy and the 400 miles between congress and alamo gordo investigators dismissed the idea that the remains were those of the missing little girl sharon and obviously, they did not have the technology back then to confirm her identity. Really dumb question on my end. How would you determine the difference between a four-year-old child and a seven-year-old child? D- dental evidence? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the correct answer there, Lance. Uh, at four, you, pr- you pretty much still have your baby teeth, or most of them. But they start falling out not long after that. So on August 10th, 1960, a funeral service was held at the Congregational Church in Prescott, Arizona. And even though no one knew who the little girl was, the place was like absolutely packed. I I guess this really moved the community like to find a dead child. And then the Yavape community actually had come together to raise enough money to buy a pale blue casket and give this unknown child a proper burial. Her headstone unfortunately read, Little Miss Nobody. Blessed are the pure in heart, St. Matthew 5, 8, 1960. I get where they're coming from with this, and all of the intentions are beautiful, right? And they want to pay their respects to this child. 
but I don't think anyone thought about later on that you've marked a a headstone with literally no name. It says Little Miss Nobody, and then you've applied a religious passage to it, so you've assumed that this person has like some religious belief, and you've just stamped no name on here. So I get where they're coming from, but it probably wouldn't have happened today in 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 this regard, right? You're saying have the religion forced upon her, basically? Or just mostly like the no name. Like, like I don't, yeah, I just feel like a different, I feel like a different path to memorialize this individual might have been considered nowadays. Honestly, I'm glad they even did memorialize her. Because, I mean, way back when, when we were all working on Suitcase Jane Doe, her remains were just incinerated, like no marker, no gravestone, no nothing, no service. Community didn't come together. Like, I get that this is a child and it really moves people in that way, but at least there's something marking her life, you know? Yeah, you know, it's a good point. It's a good point. I'm just, like, hypersensitive to this for some weird reason. I don't know why. And so over the years, the mystery of who she was and how she died waxed and waned. And there were periods of activity, possible breakthroughs that ultimately fizzled out, and long spells of silence. And the case remained unsolved for 60 long years. That is a long time for rumors to circulate and change and for information to be misheard and retold differently. I can't believe that 60 years elapsed and then we get what's coming next. So there was a lot of speculation um, about this case and about her identity. One theory was, uh, I guess... (laughs) <laughs> sounds familiar today with some conspiracies um, out there, but it's a pedophile theory. And the idea was that she was kidnapped by a pedophile or a ring of pedophiles uh, who were using her for horrific purposes. I got to be honest, that's kind of the first thing I thought of before actually getting down to these theories that were circulating. There's just something weird about the way she was dressed and like painted up. I don't know. Something in it is like reminiscent of like a like little girls who do pageants and stuff. I don't know if it was like a sexual thing. That's where my mind went first. Or maybe it was like guilt after she had passed and like they wanted to make her look alive in that way. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of what I thought, to be honest, with that they they were trying to at one point uh, care for her. And then obviously something changed. Uh, But they did say it was it was. Too hard to tell if she had been sexually abused uh, before her death. But apparently the body hadn't decomposed to the point where they couldn't tell that her hair was dyed and her fingernails were painted. So that's where you're coming from when you said that she was sort of made up, right, Jen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be some kind of pedophile's fetish or something like that. I don't know. I think I'm just a little triggered when I hear ring of pedophiles. I automatically think I, I file it into conspiracy theory territory. I don't know, though. I mean... What what goes on in someone's, uh, I don't know, fetish um, community where this, I mean, was this big back then? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a fetish for people. And is it a, a one-off where someone's doing this to their own child or, or I, not specifically in this case, but wouldn't you think that there would be more talk about this? Oh, I think it's taken a long time for people to come around to the fact that there are... <laughs> adults who abuse children and sell them off to their friends and stuff that's a pretty modern discussion it's like back in the 50s 60s and even before people didn't want to talk about things that were not nice especially in the 50s and after the wars it's like everything was hunky-dory american dream white picket fences they don't want to talk about pedophile rings or pedophiles in general they don't even want to talk about like healthy sexual relationships (laughs) let alone like you know dysfunctional ones yeah a good point yeah it, it also again i think i think there's similarities to today right we we spoke with Ladonna humphrey who mentioned the uh death fetish community lance and that was really interesting that melissa witt who was murdered and Ladonna, who's been investigating the case was contacted by people from the death fetish community and one woman approached her and said that she starred in a video where she was made to look like melissa witt Um, wearing the same Mickey Mouse watch that Melissa Witt wore uh, when she was murdered. So I do think this is a big underground fetish thing that 
does not make it to the surface very often. Yeah, for sure. But I also don't really think it's very interconnected and and like, you know, it's not it's not Jeffrey Epstein. I get that. Like this seems like a much different situation than like a uh, like a wealthy person trying to manipulate younger people. Yeah, that's fair. It does raise an interesting question. You brought up the death fetish and, you know, maybe this isn't the well, you know, we're here to explore these concepts. Like, where's the line? You know, if this fetish is making a, a you know, four, seven year old look adult painting her up so that she could compete in a beauty pageant and that's your fetish. Unfortunately, does that lead to where, where does where's the line to like murder is what I'm saying. And then death fetish, your 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 fetish is a, a sexual impulse in regards to a corpse, a, de- a dead person. It, that's also a fetish, but I think that's probably different than a pedophile's fetish. That's what, yeah. So where's where's the the thresholds here that cross you over into something that is. Uh, taking a life or or like illegal territory i'd venture to say it it all sucks (laughs) yeah (laughs) and you shouldn't do it Mm -hmm. uh yeah i don't i don't know where to find the moral line there or like i can't even pretend to enter the mind of somebody who has these fetishes but the necrophile needs a corpse to do their fetish so that one would have to be uh probably a murderer you would think um Whereas a pedophile is not necessarily that. So, yes, necrophilia and death fetish are separate things. I think so. Yeah. I'm just exploring where the uh, where the line is. Because some people have, like, bondage fetishes. But they don't stalk people and, you know, graduate to kidnapping and, and, bon- and, and binding people unless they are a psychopath. Yeah, I mean... I think there's a lot of literature on the differences between like a safe fetish and an unsafe fetish. And it all has to do with control and power. Right. Yeah. It's like, um, with children, they obviously can't consent because they're children. And then the adults are trying to have power and control over them. I think the same thing can be said about a death fetish or even a necrophilia. Like that's just like, I'm thinking of Dahmer again, but he he said that he just wanted complete control over his victim, and um, in order to do that, he killed them. Um, so it all kind of stems from the same compulsion to control, whereas something like bondage is like a contract between two people, mm-hmm. right? It's um, I would even argue that the submissive has more control than the 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 dominant one. That's a good point. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And then there were some people in town who maybe thought or assumed that um, this Jane Doe, this Little Miss Nobody, was an illegal immigrant. And, of course, uh, this location was somewhat close to the United States and Mexico international border. I think... The flip-flops were possibly a clue that pointed people to look in this direction. I think I mentioned uh, it seemed like a sign of convenience um, to just cut them and give them to to this girl. So maybe that was talked about in town at the time. Yeah, it's possible. That's for sure. I mean, and we definitely know how dangerous it is for people from Mexico to cross onto American soil. I mean, so many things can happen. Um, people have died from hypothermia, hit and runs, being run over by trains, drowning in rivers, getting trapped between rocks. Like they're in the desert, right? And and that poses a lot of danger too. So I guess maybe the theory was that she had crossed with her family into America and something had happened that was an accident or she died of exposure, uh, which is, you know, a possibility because we don't really have a cause of death, do we? Well, in this case, I think about the parents as well. Is it typical for immigrants to send their children over alone? Or did she do it on her own? Was she with uh, a guardian that wasn't related to her? And where did they end up going? How did they get separated? How did she end up on her own? You know? Yeah, totally. Well, we don't know she was alone. I mean, she was eventually abandoned. Like, her body was abandoned. 
but we don't know if she was alone at her time of death. And I think it's actually pretty common for families to split up to make a border crossing. Either, you know, the father or elder brother goes over and sends money back and they come in trips as soon as they have enough money to pay the uh, coyotes to bring them over. But yeah, I think it's possible maybe she was traveling with uh, other family members that weren't her parents or with a group of strangers. It's definitely possible. And then people were actually speaking about Sharon Lee Gallegos and the possibility that Little Miss Nobody could be Sharon Lee Gallegos. Although the police ruled her out, no DNA had actually been used to disprove their theory. And the only reason that she was excluded was the fact that Sharon was younger than what they expected Little Miss Nobody's age to be. Noting the presence of all baby teeth during Little Miss Nobody's autopsy, the age was then updated to between three and six years, which does include Sharon's age. Hmm. Seems like law enforcement was really quick to jump to that it wasn't Sharon based on speculation on the body's age. I don't know. Yeah. And then after the autopsy, they should have revisited that idea, which it seems like they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Strange. Yeah. So if it is Sharon, let's get into what exactly transpired in July 1960. Okay, so on the afternoon of July 21st, 1960, four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos was forced into a dark green car occupied by a man and a woman and possibly a freckle-faced boy and little girl. Sharon had been playing with her cousins in an alley to the rear of her home at 512 Virginia Avenue in Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Sharon, her mother, her aunt, her grandmother, an uncle, and six other Gallegos children ranging from 5 to 15 in age, resided in the modest white frame residence, and there was no telephone in the house. What is the deal with this freckled-faced boy and little girl in the car? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a detail, like a strange detail to note if you're not sure if there was children in the car or not. Maybe like one, uh, one child said they'd seen two other kids, and another was like, no, there weren't any kids in the car, so yeah, it's not. A freckled face is pretty detailed. Yeah. Well, the previous Sunday at church, this same couple or alleged same couple uh, was seen by by a church and they had two youngsters in the car, a small girl and a freckle faced boy. And apparently the woman asked about Sharon's mother, saying that she wanted to offer her a job. So I think that's where that connection was made. Um, I'm not sure if there was an actual sighting of a freckle-faced boy or a girl at the time of Sharon Lee Gallego's disappearance, but I think the connection was made to that couple from the Sunday before. Oh, interesting. Okay. And at approximately 2.55 p.m., the car, believed to be a dark green 1951 or 1952 Dodge or Plymouth, stopped and the woman asked Sharon to come with her, promising her clothes and candy. And when Sharon refused, the woman grabbed her arm and dragged her into the car. And that's according to a five-year-old playmate of Sharon's. Ugh, this is just like quintessential stranger danger. Candy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least Sharon was trained to or taught to refuse this. I mean, at least she had the wherewithal to say no. Mm -hmm. So that you know, I guess is, is something to, to, to take out of that. And what do you think about this account coming from a five-year-old child? I mean, is this something that a five-year-old kid would elaborate on or would they want to be as specific as possible because they just saw something pretty uh, violent happen? Um, hard to say. I think uh, children of that age are pretty suggestible. Um, it depends if there was many children out there who saw what happened and police interviewed them separately and their stories kind of matched up, but just like going off the word of one five-year-old child, um, it's difficult to say like everything that they say is like pure fact, you know? Yeah. But the bottom line is, I guess if you're investigating this after the fact, you know, Sharon was taken. Yeah, for sure. So the specifics of it probably aren't that important. I don't want to say not that important, but you know the deal was done. Whether the arm grab or, you know, the details of candy were elaborated by a five-year-old probably can be taken with a grain of salt because you know she got into a car and you know that it wasn't her idea to do so. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like there were a few other children 
around Sharon at the time of the kidnapping, and they gave reports as well, but some of the stories conflicted. And um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's probably just because of their age. So I don't know how you deal with that investigating it. You almost like average them together, I feel mm-hmm. like. Yeah, because again, you know what happened. I mean, ultimately, you know that she was abducted. So was it an arm grab or was it like a push? I guess that doesn't really matter. Right. And if two children say it was a green car and one says it was blue and one says it was red, you're going to assume it was green. Yeah, because like green and blue are similar. Yeah. But the red one is like, yeah, you probably didn't remember. This is a long time ago, as we've noted. Um, but I think now, hopefully, if a department, police department is like well resourced, they know how to interview children of this age or they'll bring in an expert like a child psychologist or a developmental psychologist. That's a good point. To, to get as accurate a read as possible, because it's really easy to steer children um, into saying what you want them to say. It's like, who knows if the police like asked this five-year-old, it's like, did you see a green car? And they're like, yeah, I saw a green car. Yeah. Depends. And there was one source that reported that Sharon's mother had said that Sharon liked to abandon her shoes. And she did so on the day of the kidnapping, that she liked, she liked to play outside barefoot. And so I, I don't exactly know where this one comes from, but if this was true... This is a clue that really should have led directly to Little Miss Nobody. Yeah, absolutely. Because as we noted before, um, that body was found with those flip-flops that had been cut down to size. So when Sharon had said this about the shoes, the body of Little Miss Nobody had not been found or at least not had been reported on, right? That's correct. Yeah, meaning she didn't know that. The body I, of I Little Miss so. Nobody yeah. had flip flops that were cut to size. Yeah, if that's true, and she said it before the the uh, the Little Miss Nobody's body was found, then that's like a huge clue. I would think the police would remember a detail like that too, um, having interviewed Sharon's mother. But police, they were trying to catch the kidnappers right away. They set up roadblocks shortly after the abduction was reported. And a neighbor, Mrs. Helen Gonzalez, said that the previous Sunday after church, a car fitting this same description, as we noted a little bit earlier, was parked in the alley near the church. And a large woman in her 30s wearing a faded cotton wash dress asked where Lupe Gallegos lived. And Mrs. Gonzalez said, I pointed out the house after the woman told me she had wanted Mrs. Gallegos to work for her. And she later goes on to say, the strange woman also asked if Mrs. Gallego had a little girl, whether or not she had a lot of children, and if the entire family lived in the house or if it was divided into apartments. Well, this is not suspicious at all. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, she's clearly casing the Gallegos family by asking the neighbor all of these questions. And this description of the woman fits with the description of the woman that was with the uh, fair and thin Caucasian man who was driving the car at the time of the abduction, correct? Because there was an account of this Caucasian man driving the car and apparently it fled south and turned west onto Fifth Street right after Sharon's abduction. And the woman had been described as a heavyset woman in her 30s, short, heavyset woman in her 30s with dirty blonde hair. So this is a very similar description. And 16-year-old Mary Lou Badial was visiting the Gallegos family and noticed a car believed to be a 1951 or 1952 Dodge. And she said the woman just sat and stared toward the house and didn't move when Mary Lou stood in the kitchen doorway. Oh, that's so creepy. Yeah. Stop it. And then we've got an 11-year-old, a Dolores Badial, a relation of Mary Lou, who went with Sharon to the neighborhood grocery store shortly before Sharon was kidnapped. And Dolores described the woman as short and fat with dirty blonde hair. Dolores said that on their walk home from the store, upon seeing this green car, Sharon expressed fear and asked to be picked up and carried as they passed the vehicle. So maybe Sharon had had an encounter with these people before. This woman just sits there and stares at children. She's clearly terrifying Sharon. Well, you're totally right, Jen. I mean, Sharon clearly was disturbed by this, no matter what previously happened or didn't happen. Right. I mean, maybe Sharon was approached before even by this woman or this couple. I don't see why she would react with fear if she didn't know anything about that woman or that car. 
Oh, it's so sad. I mean, imagine how afraid you have to be to ask somebody to pick you up and carry you past something. Hmm. Like she just wanted the safety of somebody else holding her. Well, oh. apparently this same woman uh, had made previous advances towards Sharon um, because Sharon told her mom that she did not want to go to the grocery store alone on this day. And in the past, she loved to go to the grocery store alone. And Mrs. Gallegos had asked her to go and grab her a bottle of ketchup. And Sharon said no on this day. Huh. So I guess she was approached before at this grocery store, potentially. Or on her walk towards or to and fro, yeah. Yeah, or she was just generally scared because something scary had happened and she didn't want to be alone. And at the time of the abduction, Sharon's aunt Beatrice was in the house and upon hearing the commotion ran to the door only to see the car speed away. And she said, my first reaction was to jump in the car and chase them. However, I suddenly remembered I didn't even know how to drive, so I ran for help, and the car just seemed to disappear into thin air. But really, what a frustrating, agonizing moment for her poor aunt. She sees this car speeding away, and she knows that her niece was most likely abducted, and she can't utilize the one thing that could probably help a lot in the situation, and that's the car, her her family's car. That you can't drive. I can't imagine how helpless you might feel or like how guilty you must feel after the fact. Now, with all the stalking that we've heard this woman had performed, do you think that she knew that Sharon's aunt didn't know how to drive? There's no way she could have known that unless she had somehow scouted to the point where that information was given to her. Yeah, I don't know how much thought was was put into it. Clearly, they, this woman uh, made a lot of effort to understand Sharon's like behaviors and where she would be and how many people were in her family and how many rooms were in the house and all that stuff. So I wouldn't put it past her for knowing a piece of information like that. But I mean, what are the chances like the aunt would would be the one who saw Sharon get taken and then couldn't do anything about it? Unless, yeah. like, they had some sort of, like, routine where Sharon would watch the children during these hours. Yeah, I think all the prep that they did essentially led them to get Sharon in the car. I think after that point, they, you know, they clearly behaved differently because he's speeding away. So after Sharon's abduction, there was various law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, who worked around the clock in effort to find this little girl. And then the police and actually questioned a man named Lester Davidson. And Lester was the father of a transient family with four children who panhandled and hitchhiked. The family had apparently been seen in the area where this body was found, and also possibly in the area where Sharon lived. However, it was determined that he and his family likely had nothing to do with either case. And after Sharon's disappearance, Mrs. Lupe Gallegos made an open plea to the kidnappers to return her daughter... Quote, she's my baby and I miss her. I love her so very much, end quote. Her mother said she could think of no one who would have a motive to commit such a crime. And there were no ransom demands and no word or sign of the unknown couple afterwards. God, I mean, that's a pretty interesting statement to make. Uh, She could think of no one who would have a motive to commit such a crime. I mean, does anyone know anyone in their social circles that you'd be like that person is totally capable of kidnapping a child you know like this is just agonizing yeah i don't know i mean my mind goes to you know uh bad deals with the parents or other adult family members you know it's like if you're involved in gangs or cartels or whatever often they'll they'll use your family against you as leverage it's like if you owe me money I'm going to take your kid until you give it to me. But nothing like that happened after Sharon's abduction. Because, Tim, you said there was no ransom demands. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which which must be a weird feeling waiting for that. And this poor individual, Lester Davidson, was living a life, a transient life, and he's pulled in for questioning. I wonder what there was that he said, or was it the appearance? Like, what was it that they released him on you know and said he didn't have anything to do with it was their alibis a combination of a number of things but either way i guess you have to question somebody like that because they seem like probably the most likely 
suspects. Uh, but it, it has to affect somebody, you know, to be pulled in and, and you, you feel guilty answering the questions even if you didn't do anything. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, if I were police, I too would probably bring them in for for questioning. But especially during this time, leading an unorthodox life, like being transient and traveling around the country with your children, probably seemed pretty eccentric and therefore suspicious. And so some of the theories that were considered at the time, um, I think it's always initially looked at about family in a case like this and a relative or possible acquaintance of the family was the first sort of theory of who abducted Sharon. And then the second theory was that it was a transient couple, possibly connected with one of the numerous construction projects in the area at the time. And they may have observed Sharon and been attracted to her in some way. I guess construction sites will hire on people who are passing through for a brief, you know, amount of work, and then they move on to another place so i guess those things were happening around town so there was like day laborers yeah i guess and possibly saw sharon i mean that's a it's a theory and what about this possible theory that a childless couple or maybe a couple who had lost a child that was similar in age or appearance to sharon wanted to take her as a form of adoption but they couldn't do it uh, legally. This was my first thought. We heard stories about that too. I mean, what comes to mind is Donna Green's yeah, story. We had absolutely. her on a while ago, but yeah, she had given birth to a baby and some woman came to her house and stole her baby and she has not been able to to find her child after, you know, how many years? Like 30 some years? Yeah. Uh, yeah, people, people take children. Well, also in Donna's case, um, Raymond was too young to know the, the difference, right? Like, uh, so Sharon Lee Gallegos was four when she was abducted and she may remember her in original family. I think that was the goal. And I think that's the goal of a lot of these couples or, or people who would abduct a young child is that you hope they don't remember their previous family. You want them right. to be in your family now and just think that you're their birth parents, which is, I think would probably happen with Raymond. Yeah. Yeah, that is such a great point because what happened with Raymond was the woman had almost like cased the hospital and, and saw the infants. So that's a great point that if you're taking the child, you don't want the child to know that this was an abduction. And this seems like a case where the person, if we are going down the path of this woman in the car, this couple in the car, and she's stalking Sharon, she obviously knows that by taking her, this little girl is going to know that this is not her real mother years down the line. So that's a, it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, it's also, yeah, it is a really good point, Tim. Um, but it's also like not, like that reason isn't totally justified by the fact that little bit nobody's body was found, that Sharon died, yes. if, that, if that was the case. Because why would they seek to adopt a child and then murder that child? Unless it was an accident of some kind. Yeah, or just like put the child out there in the elements because it wasn't working out. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, something happened if if that theory has any, you know, holds any water to begin with. Um, and again, you know, based on the flip-flops that Little Miss Nobody was wearing, there was, and, and makeup and fingernail paint, you know, there was, it, it's either a fetish thing or or that, or they were trying to make her part of their family and something happened. Oh, maybe like she ran away or something, you know, she knew that this was not a situation that she should be in. So there's this fourth theory that is like wild to me. This is super creepy. <laughs> yeah. I, oh my God. So th I guess there was theories or rumors floating around or maybe this is just like talk in town or whatever. But so this woman that was reported being seen stalking Sharon, approaching her, uh, was actually a man disguised as a woman to confuse witnesses or for some other reason. The only witnesses near the abduction were children. The aunt was 40 to 60 feet away in the house and according to officers, actually suffers from an eye ailment that limits her vision. So she was unable to ascertain the license plate of the abductor's car and was uncertain whether it had New Mexico, Texas, or some other state's plates. Holy moly. I wonder why people's minds jumped to this. It's like, why couldn't it be a woman who abducted? Well, I think it's probably easier to 
theorize something like that than the reality that a couple would be capable of doing this because it I don't think it's like the the woman wouldn't be able to do this I think it's easier to think about two men doing this because that opens up a lot of other possibilities a woman might be a friendlier person to approach if you're a four-year-old um, versus a man I don't know maybe that's the theory well it's interesting to consider that if you're two men and for whatever reason your goal is to abduct a four-year-old girl and you make the decision between the two of you, okay, you're going to dress like a woman because that's going to be uh, a more approachable method. You know, they're, they're going to feel more comfortable. But then what happens when that four-year-old girl realizes that you are a man dressed like a woman? I mean, imagine that moment. Then you talk to the, to the little girl and what are you raising your voice to sound like a woman? Yeah. I don't know. I'm also like conscious of, uh, trans people yeah. too in this discussion like it definitely wasn't understood as a thing that happens back in the time and i don't know i guess we have the tendency to say like oh how terrifying that must be for a, a man to dress as a woman i mean no i don't want to like create that parallel here i yes and to be clear i wasn't saying that it's terrifying for a man to dress as a woman i'm saying it's terrifying for a four-year-old to be approached by a man dressed like a woman and then realizing that the intentions were bad. It's important to um, like not apply a modern lens to the time that where these theories were discussed. The, the last thing I'm going to say about that is that I think in law enforcement's mind, and maybe in the minds of the community, was that it had to have been some kind of sex thing, like some kind of pedophile thing. And the only reason a young girl would be used for sex is for male pleasure. And so they're like, well... How do we explain away this woman who approached her if it was a sex thing? You know? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's how that spun. Yeah. I think that's kind of what I was getting at when I said it's easier to, like, comprehend two men as opposed to a couple. Because they were probably approaching it from a sex thing lens or with a sex thing lens. But really, who knows? I mean, this woman could have been a victim as well. She could have yep. been been held captive by the, the man driving. Uh, you know, it's really unclear. Um, one of the other theories was that one or both of the reported kidnappers suffers from some sort of emotional disturbance or mental illness, which oh, you think? reminds me of um, the conversation that we just had about the modern lens. Like, this is kind of just like more like, well, they, they must be crazy. They're weird. How is that going to help anybody? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think these people who kidnapped a four-year-old girl after stalking her probably had some emotional disturbances they might have yeah. had some emotional issues yeah and i don't know what like how police thought of women and what they were capable of in terms of crime at the time we know now like that there's that there's lots of statistics of like women being involved in abductions and or working with a partner to abduct a child so it does happen but i don't know how how much that was like that fact was available to law enforcement or the community at the time. It's like, it couldn't have been a woman. Women don't do those things. And we're going to talk about how part of this case was resolved in 2022 after the break. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And now into more modern times. In 2013, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office reached out to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's newly created forensic services unit. They were looking for help to identify Little Miss Nobody. And in 2014, Detective Michael Scott Perry with the YCSO teamed up with longtime volunteer John Shannon in an effort to crack the case. So it sounds like there's some movement going on here in the Yavapai County. Yeah. Yeah. Way to go. I know, picking right? Picking up this cold case from like yeah. 60 years ago. Yeah. It's Holy what we crap. like to see. It's fantastic. Yeah. And in 2015, the NCMEC deployed a consultant from Team Adam, their corp of retired law enforcement officers with experience in missing child cases, to assist with the exhumation of the victim. The remains were sent to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification for DNA Analysis and an Anthropological Examination. 
Before I get to my point here, I just want to compliment your pronunciation with all of those words. Uh, anthropological, to nail on the first try, is uh, quite a mouthful. So uh, tip of the old cap to you for that. But this was 2015, and I'm wondering why it did take so long for the body to be exhumed in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it, it took so long up until this point, but then I, I, I doubt they're rushing to like get funding or, you know, I don't know if at this point her family was like trying to break down the door for answers. Um, right. So I guess it makes sense that like it took a couple of years after the case came back to uh, the national center for missing and exploited children. So then in 2016, a forensic odontology exam was done to examine the child's teeth and aid in a 3d facial reconstruction by a forensic artist The facial reconstruction was shared widely, and later that year, a tip stated that she may indeed be the missing child, Sharon Gallegos. DNA was collected from Sharon's relatives and uploaded into CODIS. Comparisons were inconclusive, but Sharon could not be excluded. There continued to be advancements in DNA testing and forensic genealogy over the coming years. I mean, you can't fault them for not working on this. Mm Mm-hmm. It seems like they're using every resource that they have at their disposal, you know, over the course of a, a few years. Yeah, once the technology caught up, they yeah. seemed really determined to uh, to solve this this case. And in 2019, the NCMEC and an FBI liaison assisted in collecting DNA from a half brother of Sharon's living in Germany, and it was uploaded to Family Tree DNA. Several attempts were made over the years to collect sufficient DNA from the bones of Little Miss Nobody, but all were unsuccessful. Yeah, you're really pushing the limits of DNA collection at this point, 2019, and you're, you know, trying to pull from a when she was found, she was already so badly decomposed. And now you're talking 60 something years later. Yeah. And we know that bones are not a great source of DNA unless you can access the marrow in those bones. And the skeletal remains being so old, I doubt there was much left in terms of marrow. However, cut to 2021, and the sheriff's office raised enough money through DNA Solves and our friends over there at Othram Labs in Austin, Texas, to compare DNA testing. And they had been successful in the past with degraded samples, and they compared Little Miss Nobody's DNA to Sharon's half-brother, and it was a match. Holy moly. So after 62 years, and this was in February of 2022, so this year... Just a few months ago, Little Miss Nobody was positively identified as the four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos. Yeah, and investigators formally announced in a press conference in March that they were finally able to positively identify and give a real name, her real name, to Little Miss Nobody. That's fantastic. And I'm wondering how many people were listening to this and they got to a certain point wondering when we were going to mention Othram. Because that's what Othram does. Othram identifies the unidentifiable and they solve cases. Just this week, we were lucky enough to catch up with Kristen Middleman of Othram Labs. The very same Othram Labs that helped to identify Little Miss Nobody. So I'm the chief development officer here. I came in after David demonstrated and the team demonstrated that this works and that it works well. And that the biggest problem that we were sort of hitting every single time was there was no funding for the cases. Most of the funding that's out there for DNA testing is is geared towards legacy technology, CODIS testing. CODIS testing is the standard forensic testing used in the U.S. today. It looks at 20 markers in your genome, and it compares that profile with all the profiles in the CODIS database. The CODIS database is built mostly of known perpetrators. When you have a direct match, that identity is confirmed. So CODIS was meant meant to confirm identity. What we do is very, very different. When CODIS testing fails, for example, you put in that DNA profile and you get nothing. You don't have a hit in CODIS. It becomes a DNA dead end and the cases used to be just stuck there. What we do here at Othram is we, we, we take that DNA and we build a profile that has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of markers using uh, forensic-grade genome sequencing. 
Then we upload that profile into a genealogical database consented for law enforcement use. And we're able to catch relationships that are super distant, like a fourth cousin, a third cousin, a fifth cousin. And all of these different matches allow you to be able to figure out where that person fits on a family tree and where they belong. And then we take that information, return it back to the investigators as an investigative lead, and then they contextualize it to their investigation. Can you take us through uh, the journey that Little Miss Nobody went from DNA sample to uh, being identified uh, with the help of author? This story is actually a, a really good example of what can go wrong if you're not working with a lab that can get enough information. And so what happened is they they got a profile, but the profile didn't have enough information. And then some computational work was done on the profile to get it to, to be able to work in a database because it didn't have enough information to work in the database on its own. And that's called imputation. And when that happened, it ended up leading to the wrong answer. In fact, the investigator very early on had the suspicion that it could be Sharon Gallegos because she was missing at the same time because she was the right stature. Just the time of when they found the remains made sense. And the report stated over and over again to law enforcement that advanced DNA testing concluded that the remains were not Sharon Gallegos. And that investigation remained cold. Michael Vogan, one of our case managers here at Othram, uh, became friends with the detective working the case. And he said, give Othram a chance. And they said, look, we, we can't. Like, there's no more funding for advanced DNA testing. We tried it and it's not going to work. It didn't work. And we can't pay for that again. And so Michael offered to find funding for the case and to work the case, which is what we often do. We actually work with so many philanthropists across the country that have helped, have helped us fund these cases, so many advocates that contribute on DNA Solves, what it would cost to buy a cup of coffee that help us solve these cases, people that buy our hats or hoodies, or whatever, everything here at Othram that we do, we do to try to solve cases. Every time you see me on an interview on TV or as part of a show, it's because they paid it forward and helped pay for a case on DNA Solves or part of a case on DNA Solves. We try to use any means we can to try and fund these cases. And so we did. We're able to get enough money to fund the testing for Little Miss Nobody. And in fact, that case funded very quickly. It spoke to so many people that are funded in less than 24 hours, I believe. We proceeded with the testing. And in this case, we didn't even need genealogy. Once we built the profile, the first thing we did was try to do a one-to-one -one comparison to make sure that um, it wasn't Sharon Gallegos because that's what the investigator thought. And it was a full match. And so we knew that's when the, we gave back the investigator the lead and um, they spoke to family and they were able to piece together the rest of, of what had happened when she was taken out of her town right in front of her sibling. She was playing on the street and went missing and then was found 10 days later. I went to the press conference for Little Miss Nobody in Arizona myself and I got to meet, um, it was her nephew that was actually there. See, people think, well, this happened 62 years ago. Is there even family here that cares? And there's always family here that cares. The room was packed. There were a ton of people from the community that were affected by the case. There were a ton of law enforcement agents that worked the case for decades. And her nephew spoke on behalf of the family. And he said that his entire life had been changed by this. He said that his mother was always afraid to let him go outside, to, to leave him alone and his siblings, and that he lived a very different life. And he lived with the story of knowing what happened to his aunt every single day and wanting to get the answers, but no answers were ever given. And he was so grateful um, for the result. And he spoke on behalf of his sister as well and, and said that they really needed this to figure out how to just move on and, and also to know where their aunt is so that they can visit, so that they can pay respects. It's horrible to know that you've lost somebody in your family and, and, and you just, they're lost in time, their story is gone. 
with no ending. No one should have no ending to their story, no matter how sad that ending is. She's Little Miss Nobody no more. She is Sharon Gallegos and she deserves her name and she deserves to be known as that for sure. And it's a tragic end to a young kid's life, but there is also a full investigation as to what happened. There are several leads. There was a woman that knocked on her mother's door and talked to her that had been following her sort of around the neighborhood for a couple of days before. Her siblings saw two children in the back of the car that took her away. And there was that same woman and a man in the car. There's now leads to this investigation that will potentially help actually identify who did this to her and what actually happened. Even though this case was so old, the body was so decomposed, it was still able to have a solution and a resolution. Um, yeah, it's an excellent example of, of what can be done and accomplished if investigators keep re-examining the evidence in these cold cases. I mean, this is one of the oldest cold cases I've seen that has been, you know, at least partially resolved. Um, it was, it did start out as a Jane Doe, but I'm so glad that she has her identity and I hope the family take solace in the fact that they like at least know that they have the right remains and uh, can now potentially bury her under her actual name. And so efforts to identify Sharon's abductors and murderers are uh, still ongoing. Not sure where that investigation is, but uh, at least a good part of this mystery has been resolved. However, this is not exactly closure. Yeah, it brings it up to the regular status of an unsolved murder. I do wonder what sort of investigation is being conducted by law enforcement when you're trying to put the pieces of a case this old together. You have a lot of accounts of abduction here. So I guess it's like follow follow that first. Yeah, I would say, you know, there could be some other accounts in the American yeah. Southwest or just in America um, of people fitting this description, maybe abducting um, children, maybe driving a 1951 or 1952 green Dodge or Plymouth. Um, so that's where I would start with that. But it's got to be got to be a daunting challenge, no doubt. Yeah, this could be something where the public has a lot more power than you might think. If you were a child you know, anywhere between seven, eight, nine, you know, whatever. If you if you were in that area during that time, maybe there are other accounts of attempted abductions. I would imagine there are. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Now, it, the question would be, do any of the descriptions of the yep. people or the cars match or anything like that? Yeah. Reach out to us if you're listening to this and you know somebody or you yourself had experienced something like this. Because I think with, again, the power of the people out there. I think that this could be something that is uh, capable of being solved. Make sure to go to dnasolves.com and check out everything Othram does and feel free to donate if you can. Every little bit counts. And if you have any information about the unsolved murder of Sharon Lee Gallegos, please contact the Alamo Gordo Police Department at 575-439-4300.